Hey everyone, this is Michael Ralph, and today we're going to be talking about significant difference. There are lots of instances where we're going to be making a comparison, and sometimes we want to know, is that comparison going to provide us with some significant difference between our expected numbers and the actual outcome that we obtain? One good example of this is a choice chamber where you have some organism in the middle of that chamber, and it's making a decision between one option and a second, and that, uh, that number of organisms can provide us some sort of outcome. There are lots of different examples. You could be making a decision between wet and dry with isopods, with fruit flies, but whatever it is, the fundamental decision being made is do they prefer one side over the other. Now if there's a five, if with ten organisms we have five on one and five on the other, obviously we don't think that there's going to be any difference. But what if there's six on the wet side and four on the dry side? Is there a significant preference over here? Or are we just talking about a coin flip? If we flip a coin ten, ten times, it's not unreasonable to think that we would get six heads and four tails. So how do we determine whether there's a difference that is significant or whether that difference is due only to chance? To start exploring this idea, we need to collect lots of trials. So I'm going to ask Excel to flip a coin for me. This functionality can be obtained using a rand between formula. And I'm going to tell it to choose between 0 and 1. And you see, as I tell it to recalculate over and over again, sometimes I get a 1, sometimes I get a 0. Sometimes I get long stretches and sometimes I don't. It's a totally random outcome, just like a coin flip. And you can see that I want to flip it many times, so I'm going to have it run more than one trial. And I'm going to paste that formula over. And I actually want to have it flip 10 times to see what's going to happen as I flip that coin over and over again. And you can see that sometimes I get heads and sometimes I get tails. This is the same functionality if I were to put 10 isopods into a choice chamber and we'll say that 0 is on one side and 1 is on the other. So let's ask a question and say, do these isopods prefer to be on the one side of the chamber or is their distribution totally random? We're going to, in order to figure this out, we need to set up a null hypothesis. What that means is, what if their choice is due only to chance? And then we're going to go about showing that those outcomes are very unlikely to match up with the data that we collected uh, from our experimental trial. So in these 10 trials, I want to know how often would we expect to see, or how often did we get isopods on the one side due only to chance. And you can see that in this particular run, I got 7 out of 10 on one side, and we know that that's due only to chance. But that doesn't happen very often. Sometimes we get very extreme numbers, but much of the time it's 5, 6, or 4 as we would expect. So what we want to do is show what would happen if we did this over and over and over again with lots and lots of trials. In fact, because we have a computer, let's do many trials. I'm going to run over a thousand, oh, not quite over a thousand. Let's run 600 and change and let's see what's going to happen. In each one of those trials, I want to see a total. And there we go. So now every time I recalculate each one of those trials is going to be slightly different. And so now we need to consider across many experiments, what is the distribution of outcomes that we would expect to see due only to chance? And so we need to consider in these metasums, what are all the possible outcomes we could see? Well, of course, there could be 0 on one side and 10 on the other. While it's very unlikely, it is certainly possible. We could have 1 and 9 all the way over to all the way over to 10 and 0. And to figure out how often each of these occurred, we are going to run a count if function. And we're going to have it consider all of our possible experiments. And in those experiments, we want to know how many of them match the particular category being considered. So I'm going to click up here after my comma close my parenthesis and the last thing because I'm going to copy and paste this one also I need to lock the reference because those totals need to be considered every time and they're in the same spot so I'm hitting F4 for each one of those references and then I'm going to paste this over for each one of my possible outcomes and they say zero right now but if I recalculate now I can see how often each one of those results is to occur in how many trials was this I wonder, let's have it total up all of our possible results. Almost 650 different choices. And in 650 trials, you can see that my 0 and 10 outcome, we knew that was unlikely. And indeed, 
frequently it doesn't happen at all. Although occasionally you have one or two do only to chance. Now that's remarkable, but as we move closer to the center line, you can see that it's much more common to have something closer to our true 50-50 division. So in, to make these comparisons, we're going to want to know how often as a percentage do each one of these results occur divided by our total and the total is going to be another locked reference and again I'm going to paste this across tell Excel that these are percentages and we want them to be represented as such and now as I recalculate you can see how often each one of those occurs as a percentage and surprisingly the 5-5 true 50-50 split that we would expect only happens about a quarter of the time so what is the distribution in this particular example well you can see that shape looks fairly familiar that's called a normal distribution or a bell curve and it shows that while the most number of trials does happen at a 5-5 split there are quite a few trials that actually have something different from what we would expect so how do we decide as scientists whether our isopod trial is significantly different from this totally random distribution that would be expected from just flipping a coin? Well, a 5-5 five five is obviously not going to be any different, but what if I got a 6-4? Well, I can see that over 20% of the time, well, just about 20% of the time, our 6-4 division happens due only to chance. So I'm not going to take the risk that that 6-4 was due only was due to the difference in preferences but instead that it's pretty likely that, that can happen due only to chance and we need to run either more trials or look for some other process to study but how about of course a 10 and 0 that happens almost almost never due only to chance so we can be certain there but where is the line what where do we as practicing scientists decide that that difference is not likely to be due to chance and we can reject our null hypothesis. Well, by convention, we usually say that happens at 0.05 or 5% of the time or less, then we can reject this null hypothesis. And so you can see that about two out of 10 would reject the null to say that there is an aversion to the one side or eight out of 10 or better would tell us that there is a preference for the one side. And this number is called the p-value. This is a very important number in our consideration and that p-value again is by convention set at 5% although there are occasions to change that number and it refers to this distribution of how unlikely is our occurrence to be due only to chance. So if in our choice chambers we see 8 out of 10 because that only happens 5% of the time due to chance it is fairly unlikely that our, our one experiment produced that due only to chance and there must be something else going on. This distribution exists for lots of different scenarios and for each of those scenarios there's usually a, a statistical test to determine where that p-value lies. Uh, there's a chi-square, there's a t-test, and there's lots of others but ultimately it gets back to the same idea of how likely was that particular event to occur to chance.